so appreciate being here. Uh, um, we, have, uh, we have some time together to really begin to um, have an understanding about how you can sustain your commitment and have a passion for po the possible with children who deserve the best that we can give. And all of us know that all children should have a home. All children should be safe. And I wish I was getting up just to tell you that I didn't need to give this lecture. You all could go and have lunch because there's not going to be any more traumatized children. Uh, thank you, Leslie College and Mary, and um, for bringing me here. I appreciate that. So we're going to go through. Uh, the goal of what I want us to do is first have a visceral understanding of trauma and also to understand how to support caretakers and how to make life-saving connections. So the first thing that I wanted to do was to help you understand just for that, that we all have a shared understanding of post-traumatic stress disorder because sometimes you can say trauma and it's not always clear what that means. So. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, in terms of the official definition, is an exposure to actual threatened death or serious injury or sexual violence or witnessing this kind of um, violence. And the symptoms are sometimes that you can have intrusive thoughts. And in little children, what you'll see, because many of you that I heard are working with small infants, babies, toddlers, and toddlers might end up having more what you see as repetitive play, where they'll do a, um, something that they found disturbing and they'll do it over and over again. You also see avoidance, and you can see negative distortions where children will blame themselves or they'll be frightened uh, in a chronic state of fright. And sometimes you can see reactivity where you'll see aggression, and uh, this usually lasts more than one month. But what's really important is, and this is what I want to help communicate, is post-traumatic stress disorder is not a laundry list. And I want to start by giving you a story of Aaron. Aaron is the kind of child that I might end up doing a safety assessment on where I work in the Cambridge school districts because the child might be violent or aggressive. And Aaron could be sitting at the table, his head down, and it's the fifth time, maybe, that the teachers tried to get Aaron's attention. And he's militant about keeping his head down. And, and so the teacher comes from behind. Maybe she raises her voice to try to catch his attention. Maybe uh, she, she puts her shoulder on his hand just to kind of gently wake him up. But he gets shocked, comes like in a fight or flight response, and bolts for the door. The teacher, knowing that maybe he's going to try to uh, run into the, into the hallway, and if that happens, it's during cafeteria time and the hallway's crowded, so she puts her arm out to block him from exiting. And he pushes through. And what we have, and this happens in public schools and private schools, but more public schools across the country, is now we have an assault and battery because he hit her on the way out, even though he was brushed, he was in trying to get out there, and probably three to five day suspension. So that's Aaron. Then we have Liz. Liz is asked to write an um, uh, write an assignment, and it's a Monday morning. And most kids are going to be writing their assignment about having gone Halloween trick-or-treating or going to get pick apples with their parents. But what she witnessed during the weekend were her mother and her father fighting. Maybe things got thrown. And she can't think of her favorite moment for right then. So what she does is rip the paper up and stop. So what you may see in the classroom when we're talking about traumatized kids is spitting, biting, growling, cursing, masturbating, screaming. You know, there, it's not uh, a sanitized kind of expression that children will use. 
So what I want to share with you next is the Adverse Childhood Experience Questionnaire. And the reason I want to help you understand that is it really propelled us to start to understand the impact of trauma. And it was given to 19,000 adults. It was a private questionnaire. <clears throat> and it started out with relatively benign questions. You know, what's your birth date? What state were you born in? And then it would move on to more uh, troubling questions. Questions like, sometimes physical blows occur between parents. How often did your father do any of these things to your mother? Push, grab, slap, or throw something at her. Kick, bite, hit her with a fist, or hit her with something hard. How often were you spanked, touched, or fondled your body in a sexual way? You know, what's so upsetting is, and this has been repeated in other questionnaires with adults, is the, the number of adults that will report what's happened to them in their childhood. Sexual abuse, 20% of adults will say sexual abuse has occurred to them. 28% will talk about physical abuse. 10% will talk about psychological abuse. And in the household, 26%, one out of four adults will report that they had a substance abusing parent. 20% will say that they've had mental illness. So what I want to share with you all in a um, is to give you context for children. In the Child Protective Service, uh, they estimate that 890,000 children were victims of maltreatment. Now what's important in the slide that I show you next is, first of all, to get reported and to have it be substantiated is, um, means that someone has gone to the home and been able to get information that confirms it. And what's important is if you look at it, 564,000 of these are neglect. And then 149,000 have physical abuse and 83,000 have, have sexual abuse. But what, what's really relevant to me is when you look at the neglect, children may not be able to tell you that they have neglect. Because that's not something like you're going to be coming in and saying, mommy hit me last night. That's about maybe a child having spent two days never having gone out to the playground, not having food in their home. So what's troubling about this is our brain is a social organ of adaptation. And we're, we're fed by significant relationships. And when you have the very people who may, who are supposed to be keeping you safe, and at moments you're terrorized, what ends up happening is you end up having increased cortisol, which is part of that fight or flight response. And it bathes your brain, and it actually changes the brain architecture. And that's what I want to show you. If you look at this three-year-old, pretend like you're sliced the brain in half, their brain there's two parts of your brain that are really important in emotional regulation. One uh, is the hippocampus and one is the amygdala. They're deep inside your brain. They're sort of, they're the primitive part of your brain. They're the lizard part of your brain. And that part of the brain, when it gets bathed in cortisol, ends up changing the structure. So it ends up being smaller and not um, as capable as processing information. Now, What's important when I tell you this, though, is it doesn't mean that when children are traumatized that it's, it's deterministic. There's a fatalistic sense that nothing you can do can make a difference. The reality is that relationships and teaching kids skills with how to help with their affect emotional regulation, may we don't know yet whether it will change the architecture of the brain, but it changes how they function. But the reason I show you these brain scans is because we know, say, with dyslexia, which all of you who are 
learning early education have been exposed to, that there's a change in the brain structure. But we have come up with early intervention and exquisitely focused ways to respond to a child who has dyslexia so that the, we, we can target them during a critical period and move them so that they can be competent readers. And that's the call to action that we would have with trauma. So I don't show this to say, um, to be fatalistic. It's more to say it's a call to action. So what is trauma's impact on learning? Uh, so you have these children who come into school and maybe they've had neglect or abuse or they've been separated from a caregiver or they've had the pervasive stress of, dom uh, of domestic violence or chronic per poverty or homelessness. And these are the kinds of things that you might see. Changes in memory and writing, classroom behavior and relationships. And I told Mary, I was in the shower and I thought of this one story I just had to tell you all from, from this morning that I want to highlight around with the writing. Uh, it, it's why I went into child psychiatry. There was this girl who was a junior in high school and she had dissolved, this will be relevant to writing, she had dissolved in tears because her mother uh, was schizophrenic, was homeless, but was now moving back into the home where she was living with her father and her stepmother. And she did not want to do therapy. She was done with therapy. And a lot of times, by the time you get to high school, if you've had trauma, you might have been involved with a lot of different therapists and be burnt out on it. And what I asked her is, would, would she be willing to be in an autobiography memoir class? And she said yes. And the teacher was a little bit freaked out because she said, you know, she's been dissolving in the um, guidance counselor's office. I said, don't worry. I'll provide backup, but let's give this a try. So they wrote a, uh, an autobiography sort of piece that they did. And at the end of the, um, the course, she invited me to come to a staff member's house where people were presenting it. And what she wrote about was really remarkable. It was about when she was four years old and her brother was six years old, that her mom, who was schizophrenic and was at that time psychotic, had brought them to the mall and had sort of forgotten that her kids were with her and sort of wandered off. And the kids played in a playground. And then they realized, you know what? We need to get back home. It's getting late. And so they walked on the highway, which is actually terrifying to think about, and arrived back home. And when they got back home, the police were there because somebody had notified that there were these, they'd figured out what was going on. And she wrote about that was when, when her mother lost custody of her. And after she finished, her brother came up and I was with her and telling her what an incredibly moving story she'd said. Her brother said, you know, I never wrote anything in school. All through high school, he never wrote anything. And he said, because I was afraid of what I was going to write. And thank you for helping me say what I needed to talk about. So you all, as teachers, may have an incredible influence when you can provide the kind of scaffolding which is so critical to provide kids with an opportunity to build a narrative. But many of our traumatized kids may stumble when it comes to these kinds of exercises and need more support. So another way that I wanted to just highlight how you might see classroom behavior, if you ask a kid and you say, could you please do this? And a child who is maybe had trauma, who has slower processing um, speed, and who may also need to be in control and be a little bit oppositional and you end up saying it again because you know what, you're trying to get everybody in line and to pass the MCAS test. What, what's a lag time often gets misinterpreted as oppositional behavior. So that's an important tip to you all that when you give, give um, cues to kids, oftentimes you're wanting to give them what seems like an unnatural amount of time sometimes to process that information. Another aspect that's a classic that can happen is the lunchroom line. So you've got the lunchroom line, everybody's lined up, and some excited boy comes up, and we'll call him the green boy, and he decides he's going to get in front of a kid.
because he's just so excited to hear there was macaroni and cheese and that's what he loves is macaroni and cheese and he's got to get there. So he cuts in front of the kid, right? Well, sometimes if you have a kid that's hypervigilant who has a history of trauma, what they do is they misread a social cue that's relatively innocuous. Macaroni and cheese was not meant to have you go ballistic. But the kid misinterprets what is a relatively neutral thing and becomes enraged and pushes the child because you know what? You're in my space and you're always got an attitude and I'm gonna take you down. And what will happen is the kid often will end up, okay, you're not going out for recess or you're going to the um, principal's office or you need to write a note that says why you're sorry and how you're gonna be better. So, what are the solutions? One key thing, and it's part of what's so exciting for me to be talking with you all at Leslie, is we need to have a paradigm shift, and we need to populate schools with school adults who understand that automatic suspensions, failure, zero tolerance, are not an option. And that what we need to do is to create safe havens for kids. Safe havens where children can learn that things are predictable and that there's a structure and that there is a, a commitment to caring and healing and creating a belief in who these children can become. So uh, in what Gina mentioned is I, I, I wrote a book, uh, The Behavior Code, and it was meant to uh, help us with how to work with challenging children. And I wrote it with a behavioral analyst and it came out of a sense that there's a gap in the skills that are being taught to teachers. And that many times we, we lose 50% of teachers in the first five years. And I just learned that we lo lose um, 30% of teachers in urban districts in the first three years. And that, that's a travesty. That's something we have to mobilize as a country and to figure out what we can do. And uh, what I um, worked on with Jess were strategies about, they weren't labor intensive strategies, but they're an approach to children who may, with their behavior, be um, challenging, and I want to share some of that with you. I'm going to start with a girl named Ashley. So I ran this residential group, and it was a group with about eight children, and Ashley was this teenager, strong girl, uh, who, when, fam when the idea about families would be brought up, she would get tense. I'm trained to notice this kind of thing. And she would kind of open and close her hands, kind of get her, her shoulders would get tight. And one day, it was a day um, right soon before the holidays. And she came in, and there shouldn't have been a light bulb in this room, because it's a therapeutic classroom, a, you know, an open light bulb. And, but she grabbed the light bulb, and she looked like she was about to crush the light bulb. And I'm watching her, and I took a deep breath. I thought, OK. Um, and I said to her, it looks like you feel like your world is falling apart. And then she took the light bulb, and she just dropped it. So why am I telling this story? Well, I could have. I'm not trained in restraints, but I could have tried to come over and wrestle the light bulb from this rather large girl and say, you know, or I could have raised my voice and tried to say, you know what, put that down right now. But instead, what I tried to do was to make a positive, empathic connection with her and try to diffuse it that way. So some of the SOS tips which I wanted to share with you that I share with parents and teachers is the idea that behavior is communication. So when I was watching her with that light bulb, I'm trying to think with myself, with every analytical bone in my body, what is she trying to communicate? And how can I reflect that back to her and make some kind of connection 
so that she doesn't have to escalate the behavior to make sure I understand it. The other one, which <laughs> I always wrestle with a little bit because I do think there's something about reciprocity, but certainly in the case of with, in school settings and with parents, what I emphasize is the only behavior we can control is our own. And there's a Yiddish saying which says, uh, if um, you follow the wind, shift your sails if you get into trouble. And it's that idea that you, you, you have tremendous impact if you can mold how you're going to respond and pay attention to that part of it. So when I'm taking a deep breath right before it looks like a light bulb is, it's I'm trying to de-escalate my own sense of panic, which will then be something that will be a cue to her that I'm not intimidated and that we can manage this together. The other incredibly important uh, part I would say to you is in talking with students just in the last hour, they were talking about sometimes teachers can get demoralized and, the, and it's really hard if you come into a school setting and you're incredibly idealistic and you came in because a teacher made a significant difference in your life and you want to play it back pay it back, and you are confronted with very challenging behavior, sometimes what can happen is you can withdraw and kind of move back. And it's really a protective stance. And uh, Lawrence Seligman talks about in Learned Optimism, the way that you end up getting depressed is when you think behavior can't be changed. And what I would encourage when you're in situations, when you get to that point, is look for baby steps. Look for really small places where you can see a difference and turn it around because you have to combat that sense that nothing you say or do is gonna make a difference. So how can we help? Well, first, I think what we need to do is become much more attentive about what are the missing skills that children need to learn and then become very disciplined about how we're going to help children gain these skills. So I'm going to just walk us through some of the missing skills that we want to be attentive to. And my dream would be that in every individual ed plan, when we have an explosive child or we have a traumatized children, child, that we specifically look at some of these skills and make sure they're assigned adults in the school setting that can help kids master these skills, and if it's not in the school setting, in the clinical setting, or at a camp, but that we really make it possible for them to acquire these skills. So one is around self-regulation, and where that's relevant in terms of if you think about with homeless families is often you're going to have a parent that's very distracted because they're busy trying to figure out how they're going to get a home, how they're going to get the next meal. and so that children are going to have missed the opportunity to have what's called co-regulation. So they're going to miss having those times of attunement when they feel understood. And that's what builds self-regulation. So many times kids are going to need very concrete support with how to learn self-regulation. The other aspect is helping kids recognize thinking traps. And, you know, my daughter, I was just, I was talking with her and she, uh, um, I said something and she said, you know, mom, you're thinking on the downside. And that's something that I've done, you know, even, you know, with kids who haven't had trauma, being able to help the patterns of behavior, how do you, how do you do a put up, how do you do a put, you know, what's a put down, figuring out how to label the kinds of um, thought patterns with catastrophizing or thinking on the downside or thinking all or nothing. Those are classic kinds of thought processes that can derail how a child approaches the schoolwork. And as clinicians, we know how to, um, how to help children recognize this as, um, in what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. But I think teachers, in very explicit ways, can embed in their reactions to kids. They, they could also teach kids and reinforce that learning about it. 
So the other aspect is around social skills. And what you have with um, social skills is you have, as I talked about, kids who may um, struggle with how to tag onto a conversation or how to initiate a friendship, how to read the room, how to organize themselves. And then with executive functioning, those are all the things that you need when you write. So you need to plan what you're going to do. You need to organize and map out what, your, what the steps are. And the other piece that you sometimes can see kids struggle is with flexible thinking. So you'll end up having kids get into these power struggles because they can't get themselves unstuck. So I want to give you an example of a child I was working with where I did a safety assessment on him. And he had been spending about 60 to 70% of his time lying on the ground, doing things that we talked about, growling. Uh, um, periodically, he would have episodes where he would throw things across the room. And um, I was talking with him, and I was asking him about, trying to be explicit with him about some things that might be helpful. And I said, well, you know, if you, have you ever thought about, like, changing the channel, so if you got stuck, you know, just switching it, seeing if you, you know. It's a, and uh, he said to me, you know what, if someone was trying to help me change the channel, I would probably have my foot on the remote control turning it off. So I said, oh, well, okay. <laughs> that gave me. So I said, well, you know, um, next time, though, if you're really feeling just out of control, what about if you tried to do, and the sort of fancy term is progressive muscle relaxation, but it's actually very straightforward. It's this idea of, I said, you know, just squeeze your hands like you've got lemons in them, or bring up your shoulders, or put, put your neck up like you're trying to get a leaf off the tree as, as if you're a giraffe, or lift your legs like you're a crocodile. And so we're sort of doing that together, and then I left. The next day, I get a phone call from the principal. She says, you wouldn't believe what happened. I don't know. I mean, was he having a seizure or something? She said, you know what? He bolted out of the classroom, and he ran to the um, front office, and he's sitting there, and he's got his hand squeezed, and he's, <laughs> you know, so kids are starved, actually, for trying to figure out tricks they can do to get themselves unstuck. So these are just my little tips to us, what I just talked about. So we ran over the SOS tips. What I want to talk about now is the FAIR plan, which is something I discussed in the behavior code, but what I'd love to see at the end of IEPs. And what it does is, individual ed plans, is it looks at the function of the behavior, the accommodations, the interventions, and the responses. And the reason we called it FAIR was because partly because in schools you always have acronyms, but also because a lot of times adults will say, it's not fair that little Johnny is taking all this time in my classroom. And what I would say is it's fair that we figure out how to support Susie. You know, we have to do this. And um, if you don't pay now, you will pay later. So I want to walk you through the um, how to think about this behavior and hope that it can translate to when you're working with uh, children. So the first part is looking at the function of the behavior. And many times teacher uh, behavioral analysts will think about this. But think about this as, you know, any, how many of you all have babysat? Oh, good. Okay. You know when you're babysitting and, a, kid, and a, um, a baby might start crying, you think, are they wet? Are they, you know, hungry? Uh, are they tired? This is sort of like a, a quick cheat sheet for when you see a child's behavior and you're trying to figure out what's causing it, that you come up with these four functions. I'm going to walk you through them. So the first is attention. Now, the place where parents and sometimes teachers miss attention is that negative attention is fast, efficient, and predictable. So if I threw this water bottle, which I won't, I promise, but if I threw that water bottle, that would grab your attention. And kids figure that out. And so part of what our challenge is is to figure out how we can be as 
demonstrative when we see something positive as when we see negative. And sometimes we can get caught in cycles where we're catching kids being doing what they're not supposed to do versus catching them being good. Uh, the other aspect is around escape. So kids are remarkably smart about that. They'll figure out that if they end up uh, swearing or um, elbowing another kid sitting next to them, that they're going to end up getting sent out of the out of the, out of the classroom. And even if it's a 10-minute delay, that delay is delicious. And so you really want to be thinking about how do you short circuit that and, and how do you begin to do it? Begin to do interventions that decrease the uh, child's sense of needing to escape. The other one is around, and this is particularly true in children who you can imagine if they're homeless, that oftentimes it may mean that they don't have enough to eat or that they've had some level of deprivation. So this is around tangible. You want what you want now, and it's really hard to wait. And this can come up a lot in schools where there's a ton of waiting that happens. And the other is sensory. So you're going to see that more with, um, you know, it feels good, tastes good, looks good. You're going to see that a lot with autistic kids sometimes, that they're going to get uh, into, up, into struggles around wanting to do a repetitive activity. So uh, what behavioral analysts do, but tends to not happen so much in the classroom, is this idea of ABC charts, which is antecedent, looking at what's happening before, looking at the behavior and the consequence. And that's incredibly important. I can tell you from having done 15 years of safety assessments, when you go to read the incident reports, inevitably what's written on the incident report is minute details about how little Susie lost it and all the things that little Susie did while losing it. But minimal focus is on what was going on right before that. And that's where the money is, y'all. If you want to be able to figure out how to intervene, you want to figure out how to manage the antecedents. And this is just a scary graph that I wanted to show you because if you're in school, sometimes you'll have behavioral analysts that will send you these, will give you these little graphs which are done on an Excel sheet that take antecedent behavior and consequences and will say, I think relatively arbitrary things like little Susie is getting better and they'll show you this line of the graph. But actually, and I think it's a somewhat a form of intimidation because the reality is sometimes there's missing data points or there's, um, what, but what you're looking for when someone hands you that is you want to look for something that's more of a straight line that says that there's not so much variability and there's not as much intensity and that you're being able to have a function that's relatively uh, consistent. And what I can tell you with anxiety is anxiety is going to be unpredictable because it's kind of like a soda can where if, if the soda can's been shaken up, you won't know until you go to open it up which soda can's been shaken up. So when you start to see unpredictable kinds of patterns, think anxiety. So one of the things that really concerns me is that many times with traumatized kids, what we end up having is aggression. And with that aggression ends up being a call to give them medications. And that, sometimes you may have children who need medications, but other times what you're doing is you're, um, you're, uh, you're, you're not teaching them the skills that they need to learn. So maybe you have an aggressive kid and you end up giving a prescription say, you'll say that the kid has ADD and needs to have Ritalin, but maybe what's happening is the reason they're having the meltdown is that lunchtime is a really challenging time and they're having way too many social interactions. So what you need to do is to have more scaffolding during lunchtime or during recess and not be medicating our children. Um, we have 10 minutes, right? Cool, okay. Um, <laughs> just wanted to see. So, 
Uh, one thing I'd say is in these lunch groups, it's really, or re alternative recess, it's really important to, to be mindful about activities that will build confidence and be mindful of the skills that you want to be teaching kids. Because a lot of times, as I talked about, kids won't know about how to tag on to a conversation, how to build on a conversation, or they may not know how to initiate interactions. And those are the kinds of things that you want to be thinking about as you're uh, planning a meeting. The other aspect is around reading the room. A lot of times children will need cueing about that and this is just a reminder of telling about how I went to a birthday party and kind of came barging into the birthday party, practically knocked over the, um, the uh, um, wine glass and that slowing yourself down to take a look at what the landscape is is something that you want to be explicit with and can use language to help kids. Another aspect is around transitions. So what you really see, which breaks my heart, is when kids have to transition from, a lot of you I hear are in elementary school. And elementary school is a lovely time many times for some children because they have the cocoon of one key adult that's building a relationship. But going into the high school can often be a lot more intimidating. And that's a time that can be enormously stressful on children. And you want to be planning about how can you reinforce some of the relationships that, uh, and share information with the high school adults to help with that transition. But sometimes there are smaller transitions. And these are um, transitions which I just want to briefly kind of outline for you. And those are around stopping the activity, then you have uh, shifting to the next activity, and then you have starting the next activity, and then you have the enormous lack of structure. So if you take a cafeteria line, and my co-author's done this, it's 10 minutes sometimes to line up. That is an enormous amount of time. For kids who've maybe had transitions have been gone from a home to no home, it, lack of structure is a recipe for disaster. So restaurants have figured this out. You know, when you bring a kid to a restaurant, they give you a crayon book that you get to figure, you know. So I've sometimes, and it can be the difference between a child getting multiple suspensions or not, you can recommend having a waiting bag where you put some of the favorite activities that a child might want to do, like an Etch-a-Sketch or Play-Doh or various things to try to minimize while you teach them the skill of being able to wait. So the other aspect that I would be you know, remiss in not emphasizing as the most important aspect is building a relationship with, with children, and that uh, Winnicott, who's a famous psychoanalyst, talks about it as the holding environment. And uh, Dan Hughes has an acronym called PACE, which I think is really useful to think about. Sometimes when kids are at their most challenging, it's really hard to be playful. But it's sometimes a way of diffusing the attention. The other aspect is when, when a child has done something that's actually not OK, punched Johnny or thrown a desk. What's important, though, when you're trying to rebuild the relationship is to accept the feeling, even though you don't accept what the child's done, and to maintain a curiosity about why it is that they thought that this could solve it. So I want to go back to Aaron and tell you how I might use the playfulness, the, the pace kind of approach in trying to build a relationship. Maybe what I would come, uh, uh, I'd say, you know, you've had your desk down, you've had your head down on the desk for a few minutes, and I got the feeling you might be upset about something, and would you be willing to talk with me for a few minutes after class to let me know about that? Or you could say something like, you can keep your head down until you're ready to be part of this, but I'd really want you to be part of this because I know this is not the um, Celtics and it's not the Patriots, but I am so excited about, you know, whatever it is that you're about to teach. And it's just this way of trying to be, uh, to make a connection and be able to move him so that you're not in this oppositional struggle and things don't escalate. So I wanted to end with a poem that's one of my favorite poems. 
And it's really to uh, ask us to, um, it's by a 12-year-old boy, and it's to ask us to be in the place where we can stay connected to children who may feel marginalized, may feel alone, and to build environments that allow them to feel uh, held and healed. So this is the poem. Time somebody told me that I am lovely, good, and real, that I am beautiful inside, if they only knew how that would make me feel. Time somebody told me that my mind is quick and sharp and full of wit, that I should keep on trying and never quit. Time somebody told me how they loved and needed me, how my smile is filled with hope and my spirit sets them free, how my eyes shine full of light, how good they feel when they hug me tight. Time somebody told me. So I had a talk with myself, just me, nobody else, because it was time somebody told me. Thank you. She said it's sad, but I don't, I, I, I didn't mean it to be sad, because I'm actually saying to you all, we want to be someone who makes that kid feel so special that they're not the only person that's saying that they're special, and that we, by our very presence in their lives, will let them know how special they are. Nancy, thank you so much. Your presence here today and before in Alumni Hall has been so inspiring, right? Yeah. So thank you greatly. <laughs> <laughs>